Hallelujah. It's good morning to all of you. It's good to see you. If you're a guest, let me reiterate what Pastor Todd said. We're really glad that you're here to worship with us. Hope you have a great time. We have a, an unusual service today, but a good service uh, lined up today as we're going to ordain uh, another pastor here. Now, most of you know, but for the benefit of those who may not, the way we operate as a church is we have plural uh, pastors of equal authority. There are currently five of us. At the end of this service, there will be six of us who are pastors. We have equal authority, but we have different functions. And so my function is the teaching pastor. I often get accused of being a senior pastor. That's not how we do it. Okay. And uh, so I always try to set that straight, but we each have, have our duties and we will be ordaining our children's pastor today, Bob Cavanaugh. preparation for that, I will read a scripture, make just a couple comments, and then we'll get on with that uh, ordination ceremony. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 says this, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into the reproach, into reproach and the snare of the devil couple comments. First off, uh, these are the qualifications of a pastor. If you desire to be a pastor, that should scare you because it's a bit, of a, it's a bit scary uh, to look at. And, uh, um, but it's a good thing. The Bible says it's a good thing to desire to be a pastor. These are the, this is the bishop it says there, but it's the same. Uh, I won't get into all proving that to you in scripture. Just take my word for it if you will. Um, but it's a good thing. And secondly, I would point out uh, not that I need to because you already know, but uh, pastors are not perfect. We are not perfect, but it do, does give us a standard to aspire to. And so we should, and so we should be measured against that to see how we stack up. We have observed Bob over the last couple of years as he's led our children's ministry. Uh, we as pastors have observed that and have uh, reached the conclusion that he meets these qualifications. Not perfect like all of us, but well, he meets them well. And uh, as a result, we uh, talked to him about, did he want to be a pastor? And first he said, not a chance, but then he, uh, he came around and uh, is, is doing that. So we, we have allowed him to serve a trial period where he could meet with us at our pastor's meetings and that sort of thing. Uh, so we could see um, how he get along with us and see if he thought he could stand us uh, if, he, if he joined up. And we've agreed that he fits and he agrees that he'd like to do it. And we feel good about it, as does he. So uh, I'd like at this time to invite Bob and Michelle to come on the stage along with the other pastors. <laughs> Jack, would you like to come up here with us? Yeah. This is Bob's dad. Jack, how long have you been pastor? How long have you been pastor? Two, a, a little over two weeks, he said. No, 26 <laughs> years. Or so. And so he's going he's gonna to join us in this. At this time uh, of the ceremony, we're going to ask Bob some questions, which he's got to answer. And Bob, if you say no to any of them, we'll have a short service. <laughs> At the conclusion of asking those questions, we're going to ask some questions of you, which we're going to expect a response from you as well, followed by a prayer for Bob and, uh, and Michelle, who helps him out. You know, without him, we, without her, we wouldn't even be considering him, but <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but we're going to pray for them, and then Bob's going to bring the message. So, uh, Pastor Bruce, would you uh, lead out in it? Yeah. Um... These are actually charges to the pastor, and actually this is a charge to the church, but they are in forms of question. Um, Bob will ask you to, hopefully, um, 
answer in the affirmative, and we hope that the church will also answer in the affirmative. I had to blow these up on the printer because I can't see. Uh, Bob, do you commit to maintain a living and vital relationship with God, which will enable you to fulfill your responsibility as a shepherd of the flock? Yes, I do. Do you commit to constantly yield your life to the control of God's Spirit, so that Christ will live in you and the Spirit of God will manifest His presence, power, and love through you. Yes. Do you commit to make your greatest ministry impact through your life and example of godly Christi Christian living? Yes, I do. Do you commit to nurture your wife and family so that your ministry to them will be the basis of your ministry to the church? With all I have. Do you commit to love your flock and minister to its needs even as the Lord loves and ministers to the entire flock of believers? Absolutely. Do you commit to equip leaders who will in turn equip the congregation to be the body of Christ in the world today? Yes, I will. Do you commit to fulfill the Lord's commandment to build faithful disciples and not just believers? Disciples who will do the work of ministry of nurturing the saints as well as reaching the unbelief, uh, unbelieving world with the good news of salvation. Yes. Amen. Do you commit to lead with strength but with a motive and desire to use your leadership to serve the needs of the congregation? Yes, I do. Do you commit to faithfully study and teach the whole counsel of God as revealed in the scriptures? Yes. Okay, that's it for your part. <laughs> now to the church, and I'm going to ask you to, to uh, respond out loud. These are not rhetorical. We do expect a response. Do you vow to recognize and affirm your pastor's leadership and authority given by God to shepherd the flock in his church? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Do you vow to support and undergird your pastor and his wife and family with your sincere love manifested in faithful prayer and constant encouragement? Yes! Do you vow to never speak negatively of your pastor to others but always express your criticism or concern to him directly? Yes! Okay. Everything's yes. So. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for allowing me personally to have the opportunity to know some of the places that Bob and Michelle have been and those places that you've carried them through, carried them from, and where you've brought them to, Lord, is what we're praising you for this morning. Lord, this is all for your glory. It's always been for your glory. And Lord, as we hear the, the kids in the halls of the church, in the restaurants, in our home, just singing the songs and reciting the verses, verses that many of them have no idea will save their lives one day. For so many of them, it's changed their eternal destination already. And Lord, I thank You for that. And I thank you for Bob and Michelle allowing you to use them in their ministry. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this body. I thank you for this charge. And right now, I claim the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ over their mind, their will, and their emotions. Lord, we plead that blood over them in their homes, their ministry. And Lord, I pray that You continue to fill them up daily with Your Spirit so that they can pour out of an overflowing cup. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.
for today only, I will be pretending that all of you are nine years old so that I won't get ner nervous. That's okay. <laughs> and most of you guys know who Michelle and I are, but for those who don't, as Pastor Dan said, we are your children's ministry leaders here at the church. And, and our job, I guess, I guess you'd call it, is to lead your children uh, to the feet of Jesus. And I don't call that so much as a job as I do a privilege. Uh, and I, and I, I, we pour our lives out over there, and I'll tell you why. Because it probably wasn't six, maybe eight weeks ago, the last time one of them walked up to me. And I said, hey, buddy, what's up? He said, I want to give my heart to Jesus. <laughs> and guys, if you've never experienced that, you truly do not know what you're missing. But I don't want to mislead you. I don't want you to think that you have to be gifted in leading anyone to Jesus to help us serve a children's ministry. We have all kinds of needs. If you can smile, point somebody to the right room, check them in at the computer, say, hey, 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 slow down. Somebody's going to get hurt. We have a spot for you. And so if you're not serving a children's ministry, I implore you to sign up and come join us once a month. And that'll be my one and only shameless plug for children's ministry this morning. Sign up sheets at the Welcome Center, and I hope to see you next week. So, so uh, a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know, I asked Dan if I could share this morning. Uh, I, I have this mind that just won't quit questioning things. I'm not the kind of person that's going to ask you why the sky is blue. I want to know why blue is blue. Why isn't it green or red or orange? And so sometimes that gets me in trouble, and now I have Google, so I can find the answers to these questions. It makes it even worse. It's just a horrible thing. I'll give you the example, and you can make up your own mind when my research was done. Uh, but did you guys know that in 1596, a man named John Harrington invented the flush toilet? <laughs> did you not? Now, that's right, John Harrington. Now, Sir John, he was nobility. This thing was far removed from being a port John. Uh, it took seven and a half gallons of water to flush. It was in a cistern located on the second floor, and it came down through a pipe and flushed the bowl on the first one. And so John's reasoning was, well, we go through drought sometimes, and water can get scarce, so we don't want to waste water. A whole lot of people can use the John in between flushes. Now, the problem was only rich people could afford this. First off, you had to have a two-story house, and most people didn't have that back in those days. And so it wasn't until 1880, 300 years later, that the modern-day float and flapper system that we use uh, was invented, and that was invented by a guy named Thomas Crapper. <laughs> I kid you not. And so, and so I can see that suddenly things are making sense to people all over the room. And so my point, the reason I want to share that with you is because today, today I may not teach you anything new at all. But what I hope to do is to help you look at something you're already familiar with in a different way. Much like you will look at the toilet differently from now on. <laughs> so if you will, pray with me. Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you that you've given us this house of freedom where we can come and we can laugh together, Lord, and we can cry together. We can celebrate in our victories and we can mourn in our loss. As one big family under the name of Jesus. I pray that the Lord, Lord, that the words you've given me to say today will not only challenge someone's heart, but they'll change it for the better for the rest of their life. Amen. Amen. All right, so you guys know uh, a little bit more about me. You guys know that Pastor Todd and Pastor Dan are both hillbillies. They're proud to claim that one from West Virginia, one from Eastern Kentucky, much like the Hatfields and McCoys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not a hillbilly. Uh, <laughs> however, I did for a short period live in the foothills so if I had to give it a name, I guess you'd call me a hill bobby. Uh, that'll work for me. You can use that. And we lived in the backwoods when I was just a boy, when I was about you guys' age. And the roads were so narrow, you only had to look one way before you crossed the street. So, and you know, it's funny, we're made in the image of God, so we know that he has a sense of humor. And as I was coming up with these jokes and writing them down and chuckling along with the spirit inside me, the Lord said, hey. That'd be a great place for Matthew 7, 14. In Matthew 7, 14, if you don't know, it says, But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And so my father, as you guys just saw, is a Baptist preacher in a small town. And so when I grew up, that, that narrow road that Jesus was talking about wasn't hard for me to find at all. In fact, it was right in front of me. And it's true. You only had to look one way before you thought about crossing that street. And so until about the time I was 10 or 12 years old, and by all accounts, I was a walking testimony, but then I started to rebel. 
And so I want to take this next little bit to tell you guys a story about this guy. All right. Now, unfortunately, what you see in that picture is what you got back then. That was 100% pure thug, uh, which may shock some of you. Others go, I knew it all along. I knew it. I knew it. And so kids that rebel are often called prodigals. Uh, and so when I was talking to Dan about what I wanted to teach this morning, I said, yeah, Dan, I've heard this story of the prodigal son a bunch of times from all different kinds of perspective. But what I've never heard is I've never heard it from the prodigal himself. I mean, I've heard prodigals teach the message, but I've never heard it from the prodigal himself. I mean, what was that guy thinking? And so I said, I'd like to bring the message this morning. And if I had to put a name on it, it'd be, what was I thinking? And so our text this morning is going to be found in Luke chapter 15. If you want to uh, read along, we'll have verses on the screen, but if you want to read along, uh, I'll be using the BIV, which is Bob's improvised version. It closely follows the New Living Translation, which is what I use when I teach the kids, because it's a little bit simpler for them to understand, but even that can get a bit tough. And so I find myself in the position of breaking that down just a bit further. So as I go, you may notice that I stray from the text a little bit. I think you'll agree I stay in context with the, with the heart of what the verse means. So in Luke chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 11, uh, one day, let me set this up for you. One day, Jesus was teaching. And as, as often happened, uh, what we call habitual sinners were coming out to hear what Jesus had to say. I'm talking about the kind of folks that you'd look at them even today and go, what's he doing here? Or who does she think she is walking up here like that? I've seen her last night, and blah, blah, blah. And so all these people are showing up, and Jesus, perceiving what the church folks were thinking about them, the Bible records Jesus told them this story. He said, a man had two sons. And the younger son told his father, Daddy, when you die, you're going to divide your stuff between me and my brother. Can I have mine now? And you'd think that'd be a shock to the dad. But the dad says, sure, son, I'll do that. And he agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. In another version it says, oh, but not many days later, that younger son, he packed up all his stuff and he moved to a distant land. And when he was there, he wasted all that money his daddy had given him on wild living. And now, as I had said earlier, I was a walking testimony until about the time I was 10 or 12. But then I started experimenting with some stuff that I had no business messing with. And so if I can, I will take the next few minutes to talk primarily to you guys over here. This will be for everybody. But you guys over here, I want you to look up here and listen to me for the next few minutes. My personal thing was drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and tobacco. Now, that, that doesn't mean that's what could be your thing. Because the point of today's message isn't exactly that, although that's a big part of it. The point is, when you're feeling bad and you don't want to feel like that anymore, or you're feeling good and you want to accentuate it, and you want it to be even better, it's whatever you run to, whether that's food, television, video games, improper things, on computer, whatever it is that you run to instead of the arms of Jesus. That's what this message is about. And so, but some of you guys are starting to reach the age that I was at when I started to go astray. And so if you're curious, and some of you may have already started messing with some of these things, I want to explain to you what you're getting yourself into if I can take some time to do it. So drugs... If I had to put a label on it, and I won't get off in the nitty gritty, if I had to try and describe it to you, it's like, have, have all you guys seen the Lego movie? Well, there's a character in the Lego movie. This is Emmett from the Lego movie. And if you don't know who Emmett is, he's, if the Lego movie has a main character, it's, I guess it's Emmett. But there's a song in the movie, Everything is Awesome, that Emmett really likes. And Emmett is the eternal optimist. And in Emmett's world, Everything is just going great. It's going fine. In fact, I've prepared a clip so everybody who hasn't seen the Lego movie can kind of figure out what him it's all about. You guys go ahead and play that for me, Brian. So that's who Emmett is and what Emmett's all about. So everything in Emmett's world is just awesome. It's just fantastic. And so the first time that you ever do drugs, everything is awesome. But then you start to come down. 
and I can't quite put my finger on it for you, but I'll, I'll try to get close. Coming down, like, you know how it is when you're sick? Not at the beginning of the end, but right in the middle when you're just miserable and you wish everybody would just leave you alone. That's what coming down is like. And then the guilt and the shame start to close. And sometime later, you're at a party or something, and your buds say, hey, you know what, make this better? And so you do it again, and everything is awesome. But then you start to come down, and the guilt and the shame close it. Some more time goes by. Maybe you've had a bad day, and you just you don't want to feel the way you're feeling. So you call your buddy, and say, hey, you got any more of that? He goes, oh, no, man, I don't. I know where we can get some. You got any money? And so for the first time, you buy drink. And everything is awesome. And then you start to come down and the guilt and the shame start to And then more time, everything's awesome. Everything's awesome. Everything is awesome. And then it's got you. And now you're trapped in this grasp. Guys, when you're in there, trust me when I tell you that the devil's not going to let you out of this prison that you've created for yourself. If you're not in real prison already without a fight. And you can talk to any of these people that have broken out of this. And they'll tell you just how hard it was to break free from all that. And the truth is, some people never do. And they die in there. Actually, you don't need to mess with that stuff. Pay attention to the rest of my message. And I'm going to tell you where to go when you don't want to feel like you feel. All right? So, back to my message. Thank you guys for indulging me for those few minutes. All right. So, just like the prodigal, I went and lived in a far country. And for years, I squandered everything I had on wild living. And I wonder if there's anybody out there that can feel me when I say, guys, you can go live in a far country and never even leave the house. Because when you're out there and you wish everybody would just leave you alone, and you start to separate yourself emotionally, spiritually, and physically from the people who love you to them, you might as well be a thousand miles away sitting in the same room. And no amount of text, phone calls, or emails can get through. And they just wish that you would come back home. And so our next verse says, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he began to starve. And so when we study in the Bible, you know, a lot of times we look at it and we think, well, that doesn't really apply to me. And guys, I want you to understand something. When you're looking at stories like this, though your life doesn't line up exactly like that story, the, the intent is, can you see yourself in that story? And so for me, the best way I can describe this is in an illustration I heard from a pastor named John Bevere. And I, I'm... If you don't know who he is, he wrote the Bay of Satan, a very famous pastor. Uh, look him up on YouTube, you will not regret listening to one of his messages. Uh, and I heard him say this one time, and I said, man, I'm going to have to share that. But I've modified it greatly, so if you've heard this, then it's going to be a little different than you may have heard before. But John Bevere says, life is like a minefield. And a minefield for you guys over there is, when we go to war, the enemy will plant bombs under the ground. And those bombs have a little button that sticks up. And if you walk on it or drive over it, it explodes. And so John Bevere says life is like that. Life is like a minefield. But God has given us a map to get through this minefield. And the map's called the Bible. But if we're being honest, how do most of us treat the Bible? Most of us, it's like this. So there I was, in the middle of my minefield, 
Life's exploding all around me. I'm being tossed to and fro. And I'm in the middle of what I would call a spiritual fail. And the next verse says, He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the field to feed the pigs. And the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. And so as I said, when you're studying, you've got to look for yourself in these things. And so the best way this lines up with my life is I was in my early 20s, I guess. I had a pretty good job, making twice as much as my peers. Uh, and I had my own place, and Bob's place was popping and rocking every night of the week. <laughs> and every night, the metaphorical pigs would come over, and I would feed them. And as they sat there and feasted on what I had set before them, I would look around couple over there. Well, she really loves her. I wish I had somebody love her like that. That guy, man, he's so cool. He doesn't care what anybody thinks about him or says. I wish I could be stone cold like him. Or not that enough, this guy. He's so popular and everybody loves him. I wish I could be like that. Sometimes I wonder if these people even really like me much less love me. And so, at that point in my life, I didn't have a single Christian influence left other than my mom and dad, but they were a thousand miles away back home, figuratively speaking. And I was miserable on the inside. I mean, I put on a happy face, and I would go and laugh with people, but on the inside, I knew. I knew what was going on. And every night ended the same. Everyone would leave. And there I was. And I would cry out to God, oh God, I know what I'm doing wrong. Please forgive me. I don't want to be like this. And the next morning I'd wake up, many of you guys get a test of this, and I'd say, man, I'm not going to do that tonight. And the day would wear on, and the feelings would subside, evening would come, the pigs would come over, and I would feed them. This went on night after night, year after year. In verse 17, the Bible says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food. They have enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. And somewhere along the way, the Lord planted an image in my mind. I know you guys have just started coming to the altar to, to seek God on wisdom and, and what you should do in different situations in your life. And so I want you to understand, sometimes the answer to your prayer will come in the form of just a, a picture, not like a dream, but just like a, a mental image. And the image God gave me was of what I call across the room Christians. So we got a few of them here. Um, and across the room Christians, if you're not familiar with who that might be, is they're not like your normal church going folks. These people, it seems like every time you see them, it's, oh, praise God. God is good, isn't he? God, so, hallelujah. Or you're telling them your story a bit. Would you pray for me? And they go, absolutely. And they'll put their hand on your shoulder and start praying out loud right then. And you're standing in the lobby in front of God and everybody. And from across the room, somebody would go, that dude, he's a Christian. He's God. And so God put that image in my mind of these across the room Christians. I mean, these people are never miserable. They're never depressed like I was. I mean, sure, they get their feelings hurt and they get sad. Or they might get mad. But it seems like they snap right out of it. And the next time you see them is, hallelujah, God's good, isn't he? You know, so those kind of people. And he put that image in my mind as it relates to this story is, and they got enough to share with you, Bob. And so, like the prodigal, I said, hmm, I'll go home. I'll go to my father's house and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you, would you let me join back in this? These people got enough joy to share with me. Might find some real friends there. And so here's what happened next. I'm in my early 30s. Like I said, a lot of time. Wasted a lot of years. 12 to 30 something. I'm in my 50s now, in case you wonder. So it's been a while since then. Uh, so I have heard Caleb a time or two. I guess. Um, I had never been to one of these non-denominational gatherings where people from all different backgrounds and meet in a warehouse. It was just weird. It's a warehouse. 
And so, the first time I walked into one, the worship team was one person. And when I say it was one person, I want you to imagine former 80s hair band successful rock and roll musician. I mean, successful singer songwriter type of guy. When I say one person, I mean the dude carried the stage. It was nice when we got drums in the hall. But it wasn't hokey, it was just this one guy and his guitar. And I know this next part, um, some of you who are familiar with this song say, that's not really how that goes. But to these eyes, and these ears, and this heart, what came out of his mouth, and what was on that screen, went something like this. Went, Light of the world. You step down. Open my eyes. Glory. Let me see God. Beauty that made this heart adore you. A hope of a life spent with you. Hallelujah. Here I am to worship you. Here I am to bow down. And here I am to say, You're my God. Amen. So the next verse says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, and guys, trust me, at this point, I was still a long way off. And if you're thinking you've got to get right before you can get right, it's not the way it works. His father saw him when he was a long way off. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. And he embraced him, and he kissed him. It was on that day that I finally realized what Romans 10, 13 really means. This is the last verse of the Romans Road Challenge, guys. We're doing that over at Children's Ministry. Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And guys, I was way too terrified to walk down the aisle that day, but in my heart, I fell to my knees and I said, oh God, is it even possible that I would not just be one of your iron servants, that you could turn me into one of those people? But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on it. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. But this son of mine, he was dead. He's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And so the party Woo! began. Oh! You guys, I want you to know. I thought I knew how to party. I really did. But according to this, I was just wasting my money on wild living. Because according to the words of Jesus himself, the party doesn't even start oh, yeah. until the day you come home. Yeah. And at one point, I can tell you if you're feeling like this, at one point I was angry at God. I thought, how unfair, how cruel of you, God, to put me here and make me choose between what I consider to be fun and the church. And I think back now about the pigs that I was feeding and what God has replaced them with, the friends he has put in my life. Guys, I think some of these guys would take a bullet from me. You guys would take a bullet from me. <laughs> Bruce, where are you going? Sit down. I'm just messing with you. Bruce ain't going anywhere. I had to lighten it up. It was getting a little too heavy. Children. Children. And so, for a while there, I thought I could have it both ways. And maybe this is you. And Satan's whispering in your ear, ah, that euphoria, that's what heaven feels like. God just doesn't want you to have your inheritance now. That's why he doesn't want you to have it. And I thought, well, he's a forgiving God. I can do both. I can live like I want to during the week and go to church on Sunday. And there's a popular phrase called living one foot in the world and one foot in church. And let me tell you, that's a lie. God rejects that. God says, if you want, I remember specifically asking God, can I have one day for me? 
They said, Bob, you can have them all. God rejects that. If you think that you can live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, that's not the way it works. You're living with both feet in the world that you occasionally bring into church. But in God's eyes, you might as well be a thousand miles away from where you're sitting. And I know that this story goes on. Um, my time's running short. And it talks about the brother outside that wouldn't come in. And I would love, guys, to come back and share that story with you at a different time. Um, but for now, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And I want to share three pleasant thoughts with you. Um, before I was in children's ministry, I was on the prayer team. And if you ever came down here to pray and I came and laid hands on you and prayed over you, you may have heard what I said or you may have heard a piece of what I said. But if you didn't, I want to share with you what I was saying. First off, I thank God for your humility. Because it takes some nerve to get up out of the seat and come down here. But time and time and time again in the Bible, it records that he humbled himself before the Lord. And so I always thank God for that. And I pray that he would let you see just how glorious of a robe and a ring he has in store for you. And as I was preparing this message, I thought, you know, those things get glossed over so often. So here's what I want you to know about the Lord. When the prodigal came home, he said, get, a, get the finest robe in the house and put it on. You guys, in the Bible, a robe <coughs> was something special. I mean, everybody had a coat. Everybody had a cloak. But a robe meant something. A robe meant that from across the room, a person could look and go, hold oh, He's not a servant. He's a child. He's an heir. He's part of the family. And not only does God want to put that robe on you this morning, He wants to give you the finest one in the house. The next item in this story is the ring. He said, put a ring on his finger. And back then, if you wanted to give somebody an order or a command to do something, you'd write it down on a parchment, fold it up, drop some hot wax on it, and you would press that ring down the wax, wax to seal it. And that image that that ring left meant you spoke with the authority of the person that gave it to you. If God not only wants to put a robe on your back, He wants to give you the authority and the power to speak from His Word. And then the final, the final thing He says is bring some sandals and put them on His feet. And even I had overlooked this for a long, long, long time. And when I think about orders of clothing and I think about the Bible, well, of course I'm going to think about the armor of God, where it's the belt of truth and the shoes of the gospel. Peace. Guys, not only does he want to put a robe on your back and a ring on your finger, he wants to give you a peace that you've been looking for. And if you're out there and you're tired of feeling the way you're feeling and you want to just feel different, then I'm going to invite you to come here a second. Or if you're feeling great and you wish it could be even better, I'm inviting you to come. Anything that you put in the place of Jesus is waiting for you down here. If you'll just listen to 1 Peter 5, 6, where it says, So, now that you've heard all this, humble yourself under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. Father, I thank you for this time you've given me to share your word this morning. I pray that your spirit would move across this sanctuary and that you would open eyes all over the place and they would see you as you really are. That you're not standing here with a stick to beat them, Lord. You are standing here with your arms outstretched and in one hand you're holding their robe and the other you've got their ring and the sandals are at their feet. Won't you come? Won't you come? together.
Um, the Bible says that we shall overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And uh, and as Bob, as you were as you were um, giving us your testimony, um, and Friday night as well at CR, we got to hear Blake's testimony. And as, as we were worshiping and the Holy Spirit kept speaking to me, there's no substitute for my presence. No substitute. And as Bob was talking about that table, the Lord began to show me what he was talking about. Right? So many times we try to fill voids in our life with substitutes. Right? When God fills every void, every hole, every need, He is everything you'll ever need. But for some reason, we think we know better. We think that the world has something better. Right? And it ends up being a counterfeit. It ends up being something that creates a bigger hole, a bigger void. And then we're far worse than when we started. Thanks again, Bob. If you bow your heads, Heavenly Father, we just lift up your name and praise today. God, I pray for, first and foremost, I thank you, Lord Jesus. The, that song said, we'll never know the cost, God. Because we are not perfect. We don't know what it's like to give up something that we don't deserve. Because we all deserved it. But you gave it up. You, you could have stepped down. You could have stepped out and said, I'm perfect. I don't need this. I'm not going to do this. But you did it anyway. And you did it for all of us. So we'll never know that cost. Heavenly Father, all the voids that are in this room today, starting with myself, God, may we fill it with you. God, may we always seek to be in your presence. Lord, may our church always welcome your presence, Lord, here and when we go out. May we take it with us, God. God, I thank you. God, we thank you. We praise you. Lead us this week, Lord. Open our eyes to see the things, God, that we've been blind to. God, if we've been walking around like zombies in our own world, God, show us. God, bring that light of fire in your eyes. God, may we see it. Reveal the things to us, God, that we are, that the enemy has tried to hold tight. But he has no power. He has no strength. You are our strength, Lord Jesus. God, we thank you. We praise you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I got a couple things.